Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin and in each episode I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research and their experiences. So put your earphones in, turn the volume up and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hi and welcome to The Sociology Show. My guest for this episode was Dr Finn Mackay from the University of West of England Um, Finn came to chat to me about radical feminism and in particular her book uh, from 2015, Radical Feminism, Feminist Activism in Movement. I have to say of all the people that I've interviewed so far, this was the most eye-opening for me and the one that I learned the most about. Um, I had what I thought were quite clear ideas as to what radical feminism was. Um, Finn taught me a lot uh, about some of those ideas are myths and that actually radical feminism is not what is often portrayed in some of the textbooks and some of what you see in the media as well and also how some of the quotes are kind of misguided or misjudged or in some cases not even true. So absolutely fascinating insight into the ideas of radical feminism so without further ado let's go over to the interview. Hi thanks very much for taking the time to talk to the podcast would you like to start by introducing yourself please? Yes, hi. So my name's Finn Mackay and I'm a senior lecturer in sociology at UE Bristol, which is the University of the West of England in Bristol. Right, thank you. And um, what's your, your background, your history in the subject of sociology, Finn? Um, my history in sociology, I suppose, is when I did an A-level in sociology at Park Lane Community College in Leeds, where I was living at the time. And I've been thinking about, I've been out of education since I left school. I've done various other things and I was thinking about going and doing a degree. And I had Scottish hires because I'm from Scotland and I didn't have enough of the points that you needed to get onto a degree course. So I went to Park Lane and registered myself on a A level in sociology. I absolutely loved that. Um, and then I went to Lancaster to do my undergraduate degree in women's studies, but that was based in the sociology department. And then I did a master's in gender studies um, at Goldsmiths, which also involved a lot of sociology as well and other different subjects. And then left into the world of work uh, for a few years before going back into education again to do my PhD at the University of Bristol in the Centre for Gender and Violence Research. So I've always been in sociology departments but I suppose with a a focus so gender studies women's studies focus within that. Great and what what were your kind of inspirations were any particular writers um you mentioned feminism the theories were there any Mm -hmm. writers that really inspired you to start with? Well obviously when I did my women's studies degree I was very inspired by reading Judith Butler we were set to reading a chapter from Gender Trouble and that really blew my mind I went to the library and blew most of my undergraduate printing budget just printing out loads of chapters of that book Um, but the first sociology book uh, that I ever bought actually while I was doing my undergraduate the first academic book I bought was Sigmund Bauman's Modernity and the Holocaust and I really I really liked that as well and I liked how it had different kind of themes including what I felt was some almost kind of eco constructionist sort of themes and it could be applied to so much and I found that I found that quite influential and as I say it was the first book I bought obviously on the sociology A level we studied all the the classics and the founding fathers so to speak I never wanted to pin myself to one particular flag so I've never been one of those people that has said oh I'm a Foucauldian I do I everything's Bourdieu for me I've never been one of those people I'm just very eclectic I like to pick a mix from them all great so a bit of postmodernism interesting as well Yes, although I wasn't at the start. Um, when I first got introduced to that on my undergraduate degree, I found that all quite 
frustrating. I went to do my degree uh, in women's studies. I'd come from living at a women's peace camp inspired by Greenham Common. So I've been doing NVDA, nonviolent direct action. I've been living outside for about a year and a bit. I've been involved in political activism. And I was, I think I expected women's studies to have more of a feminist activist focus than it did. Yeah. And Lancaster at that time was very postmodern, very queer, into 1990s queer theory. And at the time, I found that a bit frustrating because I thought it wasn't concrete enough. Mm. And I kept going into my classes mm-hmm. going, but hang on, X is happening in this part of the world. And what about this oppression? What are you going to do about that? I, I always found it quite frustrating at first. Right. Thank you. And let's, let's get a little bit into your, your research then. Uh, the main thing I'd like to talk to you about is your, your book, Radical Feminism, uh, Feminist Activism in Movement. That was 2015, is that right? 2015, yeah. It was based on the research that uh, the data I gathered for my PhD. And let's start from the very basics for, for clarification. How do you define radical feminism as a discipline compared to the other types of feminism? Yeah. This is a question that I always get asked, of course, and as I say in the book, there are as many different definitions of feminism as there are people who would describe themselves as a feminist. Many different understandings of it, and within feminism you have many different schools of thought. So just as in general socialist thought, you'll have Leninism, you'll have Marxism, you'll have Marx's Leninism and Trotskyism, many different strands within the one political you know, under the one banner. And it's the same with feminism, really, loads of different schools. So all of the schools of feminism are obviously focused on gaining equal rights in different areas of life, so that women should not be unfairly penalised compared to men just because they are women in different areas. All schools of feminism are concerned with reproductive rights, bodily integrity. What's the... what? distinguishes radical feminism as I said in the book is is four things so it it also wants all the same things that feminism does generally but then radical feminism in particular it believes in the existence of patriarchy as a form of social government and that might not sound very controversial to people that look at the world and think oh well clearly small groups of elite men do tend to run the show if you look at positions of power in the mainstream that that doesn't seem controversial but some schools of feminism would prefer to look at that system as being a byproduct of capitalism for example and they would see capitalism as the most important overarching framework radical feminism came from the left as well but radical feminism just says from the outset yes there is such a thing called patriarchy that means male supremacy in mainstream positions of power, it exists, it is a real thing. The radical feminists would say that. Secondly, they would see the keystone or a keystone of women's oppression as being male sexual violence against women and children. So they would really center that in their theorizing and say, we need to look at this. That's not in exclusion of all the other things like women's role in the family, women's role at work, reproductive choices that's not in exclusion of everything else it's just saying yes male violence against women is a keystone of women's oppression it controls women's lives and you absolutely have to take it into account the third aspect of radical feminism is that they would extend that analysis of male violence against women to include the prostitution and pornography industries again a lot of people and their understandings of feminism might not find that surprising but that's quite a contentious area within feminism as a whole. You've got other schools of feminism which will look at those industries and say, how can we reclaim those? How can those be seen in a positive light as a form of women's women's work, women displaying their own agency? How can those industries help us in moving to a position where sexuality and acts of sex are not so repressed? So that's quite a contentious area. But radical feminism really wrote the book on male violence against women and extending that understanding to those industries of pornography and prostitution. And then the fourth defining feature that I would pull out in the book is the focus on women's leadership and women only organizing. Again, most people and what they think of feminism might not find that surprising, but most feminism today is mixed. Most events are mixed. And radical feminism quite clearly said, we need to focus on women's leadership. We, in order to do that and to enable women to step up, step up, learn new skills, 
provide that leadership, then we need to organize some of the time as women only in women only groups. That wasn't a form of separatism and radical feminism grew out of the general left, anti-war organizing, anti-racism organizing, campaigns against the Vietnam War, black power movements, for example. It's not in exclusion of mixed organizing. It is just a form of self-organization to allow women's leadership to flourish, really. Great, thank you, thank you. And um, would you agree with that radical feminism is quite misunderstood or uh, misrepresented in many ways as well? Yes, absolutely. So what a lot of students learn on their A-level when they do politics or sociology is that you've got three different types of feminism. You have liberal, you have socialist, and you have radical. And what students coming into my first year classes tell me is that they have received from what they've been taught and what they've read, that radical feminists are the extreme ones who think that uh, women are better than men and who want to change society so that women are, are at the top instead of men and that that's what radical feminists want. Now, radical feminists argued the exact opposite to that. So it is incredibly frustrating for me and for all people that are aware of radical feminist theory and activism to have to hear that from first year students. So yes, it's very, very misunderstood. And hopefully we can dispel some of those myths actually, because obviously the, the biggest one that often comes out is that radical feminism is completely separatist, all man hating, you know, almost kind of far right, if you like, rather than left wing. So uh, what, what do you say to people who have that interpretation of radical feminism? Yeah, well, there's an important distinction between separatism and feminism in general. And there's also a distinction between separatism and women only self organization. So if you look at the left, if you look at the trade union movement, self organization is seen as a as a political right. So oppressed groups, marginalized groups, groups of minorities are seen in particular to have the political right to self organize, to form their own space where they can lead from. Um, and as I said, radical feminism, radical feminism focuses on that, on women's self-organization. That is not the same as separatism. So separatism was a tactic to withdraw from the mainstream world to an extent and create women-only communities, which you could live in on a day-to-day -day basis, just with women seizing and learning and creating the tools of living. So as much as possible, fixing their own things. You look at the women's land movement, for example, women's communes, learning practical skills, fixing their own things, maintaining themselves, women's land movement, making their own food and things like that. Actually trying to separate themselves out from the mainstream that they critique so much and form a different way of life that could be seen as an example for other people to see that they could do it too and particularly for women to see that yes they could also learn those practical skills they could live without men they could sustain themselves separatism was a more long-term withdrawal from the mainstream into women only communities self-organization is a political tool and it often goes alongside mixed organizing so you might go to one meeting you know once a month that is a women only meeting to talk about setting up a women's event or a women's march or a refuge movement you might then be involved in lots of other meetings and groups and movements the rest of the time. So separatism is itself a discrete strand within feminism that meant a full-time women-only community. Self-organization is a more temporary for women's agency and women's leadership. It's not a withdrawal from the mainstream. Yeah, so is, was there any truth in, uh, you know, some separatism went as far as men and women on opposite sides of the equator, that sort of thing. Was there any truth, truth to that? Well, if you look at some of the women's communes and sort of women's land that was set up during the second wave, so say during the 60s and 70s, some of that was what you might call more cultural feminism or spiritual sort of feminism. They were interested in creating a women's culture. They wondered what that women's culture would look like. What would it look like when women created their own communities, their own structures, their own buildings, made their own food, ran their own lives. What would that even look like? So they looked back to scholarship from anthropology, from religion, from spirituality, spiritual movements that had centered women, that had centered female deities. And it's no surprise that they were interested in that at that time. This was a revolutionary period. It was a revolutionary moment. 
people were looking for different ways of doing things. So yes, yeah, some of that went into the cultural and spiritual, you know, what is different about women? How are they different from men? Is that a biological thing? Are men and women so different? Are they almost different species? Mm -hmm. Although, as I said, radical feminism had the entire opposite approach to that. Radical feminism always said, men and women are human beings. Women are no better than men. Men are no better than women. That was the whole point of radical feminism, was to get away from the essentializing of the sexes. The radical feminists would look at the mainstream and say, actually, it's mainstream society that sets men and women up as different species. This whole men are from Mars, women are from Venus nonsense keeps men and women separate, talks about them differently, treats them differently, makes them look different, accentuates those differences, makes them do different tasks, uh, different mannerisms, different ways of conducting themselves. A lot of that is to do with compulsory heterosexuality, of course. But radical feminism always critiqued all that. And it said, actually, it was dangerous to aggrandize any notion of a woman's culture or feminine attributes as being somehow better because actually to look at both men and women now is to look at how the gender roles of masculinity and femininity have been enacted upon men and women as subjects so what you're seeing now is not actually male and female human beings in any natural state so radical feminists said don't just swap the other way and aggrandize the way that women are because that's what been, has been done for millennia with the way that men are to say oh men are superior men are more logical men are more rational etc and nobody in radical feminism wanted to do the same with women and it was profoundly anti-essentialist but that that element is often missed the whole point of radical feminism is that men and women are not different species and that was very key to their analysis of male violence against women because the mainstream will seek to dismiss and throw that away, paint every incident as a one-off, almost in a, well, what do you expect? Men are violent, men will express themselves in a violent way, men want to prove themselves through war, masculinity is about control, these things happen, almost like the weather, like it's a force of nature that these things will happen. And in their analysis, a deep analysis of male violence against women, radical feminists were very concerned to say, no, there is nothing natural or biological about raping your child, abusing your wife or partner. These things don't come from nature. They're taught by society. Most men don't rape and abuse people. So there is no biological excuse for the men that do resort to doing that or choose to do that. And that these are products of society is such a positive message because it means if they're built and constructed, they can be unbuilt if they're taught, they can be untaught. Radical feminism wasn't a suicidal movement. It wasn't a murderous, homicidal movement. It said, there is hope. We can all change. The way things are isn't the way they have to be. You mentioned you, you studied in Leeds. That's where it all started, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I lived in Leeds for a while. Yeah, I lived in Leeds for a few years. And that's certainly where some of the most well-known kind of revolutionary and radical feminism came from Leeds and the Reclaim the Night movement was instigated by Leeds revolutionary radical feminists in 1977. Yeah. Right. And you just mentioned Reclaim the Night. I know that's that's mentioned quite heavily in your book. For those that don't know what that means, what the movement was, do you want to say a little bit about that? So the Reclaim the Night marches are usually women-only marches, as they were in the past. Now they tend to be mixed, but they were women's marches that happened at night in town and city centres to protest at street sexual harassment and all forms of rape and sexual assault and male violence against women. It was women taking back their town and city centres at night to say, we should feel safe here, these are our spaces too, we should feel safe to wander around without being sexually harassed without feeling threatened and frightened. And they started in, in Europe in the 1970s, as I said, and they're a global phenomena in the US and Canada. They're known as take back the night marches, for example. Great, thank you. I think what would be quite interesting is to look at the kind of the four, the four areas that you just mentioned, if that's okay with you. So starting with number one, um, patriarchy. How, how does radical feminism define patriarchy perhaps differently to some of the other um, branches of feminism? So if you look at, say, Kate Millett's book, Sexual Politics, so she defines patriarchy as a form of social governance. 
So it is the political seizing of power by particular groups in society. And then more than that, it's how that is normalized and sold to us as being natural and as being the logical way that things should be. So if you look at scholars of masculinities as well, like Raywin Connell, she has written about this too. It's not just that you look at, say, the Westminster Parliament, you know, is 70, 80% male. You look at the big businesses on the FTSE 100, they're all run by men. You, you know, you look at senior judges, senior ranks of the police, you look at editors of national newspapers, these major cultural, political, military, financial industries are run by men. So mainstream power is, is very much in the hands of certain elite groups of men, who, as we know, tend to be from the elite they tend to be white, they tend to be already having established themselves in the rich and powerful elite. Patriarchy is that fact of male supremacy, but it is also how that is then sold to us in society as being some meritocracy. So we come to not even notice those numbers as being a problem. And it's quite interesting that if you went up to people and you said, do you think 80% of the Westminster Parliament should be women? Most people would say, well, you know, I'm all for women's rights, but that's not really fair. So how come we don't notice that all the major industries at the moment are unfairly balanced the other way around? Because we've come to see this as the norm. It's almost as if there's a reason why men are at the top. And that goes into all the things that we're brought up with in this society, which is a patriarchal society. We're kind of brought up thinking that men are better leaders, men are more competitive, they're naturally going to rise to the top. Women lack ambition. Women are more suited to the domestic sphere. Women will always want to leave their jobs and careers, whereas men will want to make their name for themselves in their jobs and careers. And that these are biological differences and that you will just find men concentrating at the top and there's almost nothing you can do about that. So it's about the fact of male supremacy in mainstream positions of power. That's patriarchy as a form of social governance. But then it's also the ideology around it, the patriarchal ideology that tells us that these, the way that things are set up is the natural way of doing things. It has ever been thus and it will always be thus. So there's uh, structural facts that you can see and then there's the ideological background kind of propping it up as well. Whereas if you talk to, say, some socialist feminists, they would say, well, the, this is a feature of capitalism. It's because men have tended to control finance and capital and pass it on to other men. That's about how capitalism organizes itself. There are women too who are at the top of industries. There are women who are very invested in the capitalist system as well. So they would see these ways of organizing as symptoms of capitalism. Great. And so would you say that the patriarchy starts right from early socialization then? Uh, would you say that both men and women contribute to the patriarchal kind of format that we're used to? Absolutely. Boys and girls are raised in this framework. Generally, they are raised with gender stereotypes, even if families try to neutralize those. So you grow up understanding and being taught and also seeing gender roles. So boys are schooled into masculinity and girls are schooled into femininity. And that's quite a brutalizing process for both boys and girls. And if you look at the work of psychologists like Carol Gilligan, who wrote a book called In a Different Voice. So Carol Gilligan talks about in her, in a book called Joining the Resistance, she talks about the brutalizing process of gender, of patriarchy for boys. And she talks about what she calls an emotional switching off point. So the age at which boys realize that it's taboo or wrong or undesirable to show emotion, to show affection, that they will stop cuddling other boys, stop holding hands with other boys, ascertain that it's just not quite right to cry at things, to be too soft. Yeah. Even those words are very loaded, aren't they? Hard and soft to show emotion. And that this switch off point can manifest itself, Gilligan points out, around the ages of say, six, seven at school. And she suggests that that's also the age at which 
children start quite heavily policing the gender presentation of others. So children will start policing each other. You're too soft, you're like a girl, etc. And people take that on board. And she suggests that this coincides with the early diagnosis of things like behavioral disorders, attention disorders, ADHD, uh, school refusal, uh, withdrawal from learning at school in boys in particular. And Gilligan suggests that that is evidence, that that is proof there of the brutalizing process of patriarchy and that it's also proof that it doesn't come naturally and also that boys resist it. And that is really her whole point, that boys are naturally they're born into this world as human beings as loving and caring as and in need of love and care as the next person and how do you turn that little baby boy into a man you have to go through this brutalizing process which gradually tries to suppress some of that natural loving caring curious humane nature and her book is also very positive because she says, look at how tough it is. Look at how tough boys find it. They rebel, they struggle. It doesn't just come naturally. It has to be forced onto them. It has to be beaten onto them. And again, she says, well, that's good news because it means it's not their nature. It's not in their nature. And if we stopped teaching boys like that, how then would they be? So I think looking at the brutal imposition of gender roles for both boys and girls, I think, is a very important process to cast our eyes upon because there before our eyes, we, we see the social construction of gender. Yeah. And I guess once it's ground in at that early age, it's very difficult to snap out of, isn't it? It's very difficult to snap out of. And it's not really any good saying to people, oh, just, you know, snap out of it because... Yeah. People will then police each other. That policing continues. And in the work of, say, black feminist scholars like Bell Hooks, she has an excellent book on masculinity, which is a very short, accessible book called um, The Will to Change on Men, Masculinity and Love. And in that book, she has a whole chapter arguing and pointing out very honestly how women also prop up patriarchal notions of manhood yeah. and how women also are implicated in making men feel shame for expressing emotion, in propping up beliefs that showing human emotion, affection, desire, need for protection, need for care, that this symbolizes weakness, that it's emasculating, that it's feminine. So we're all, you know, we're all trapped in these symptoms really. And as she points out, as Bell Hooks says, you could go up to anyone in the street and say, would you like to see less violence? Would you like to see an end to school shootings and stabbings? Would you like to see an end to, to gang culture, to domestic abuse? And of course, everyone, most people within reason, you know, would go, yeah, of course, we don't want any of those things. But then if you say to them, OK, so are you prepared to take apart gender roles of masculinity and femininity? People would look at you as if you'd gone crazy because, again, we come back to this idea that these are somehow natural. We become so good, and that's really Judith Butler's point as well, we become so good at doing gender and acting the way we are told men and women are supposed to be, that our performances become seamless and they reinforce the notion that they are indeed natural because we've become so good at them. And people go, see, men and women are just different. Men are like this, women are like that. But it's only because we've become so good at it. And we, and we do it because, of course, as Judith Butler points out, there are penalties attached to not doing it you will be excluded, you will have assumptions made about you, you will be teased, you will be seen as lesser, so either less of a woman or less of a man, you will have assumptions made about your sexuality, whether those assumptions are true or not. So when I was doing my research with young women, teenage and young women involved in feminist activism, for example, you know, a couple of young women who were on their way off to start their life at university, said to me that they were very much looking forward to getting proper boyfriends, to having sexual experiences with men at university, and they were going to keep quiet about the fact that they'd been involved in a feminist group because they didn't want boys to think that they were a lesbian because of the association with all feminists, you know, must be lesbians. So that's an example of how getting involved in behaviour that's seen as outside of your appropriate gender display people will make assumptions about your sexuality and it may not be true. Not that there's anything wrong with being a lesbian, of course, but if you're a heterosexual young woman, you would find that problematic that people would be constantly making assumptions about you because that isn't who you are. 
And that's just one practical example of how people change their behaviour to fit in. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Finn. Um, we're going to call that an end to part one. And in part two, I think we'll look at the other three areas of radical feminism. Welcome back to part two. I'm talking to Dr. Finn McKay about radical feminism. We've talked about the first part, patriarchy. Let's move on to, to point two, sexual violence. What are the main issues in regard to sexual violence that radical feminism talks about? So, yeah, so main issues in terms of, I suppose, what, fem what radical feminists would call male violence against women. This gets called different things. So we talk about domestic violence. We talk about domestic abuse. So in the women's sector, several years ago now, they started talking about domestic abuse more than domestic violence. And that was to highlight that domestic abuse takes many forms. It isn't always physical violence. It can be emotional abuse. It can be bullying. It can be financial control, um, social isolation, all sorts of things. And in society now, this is called things like gender-based violence. But radical feminists would call this just quite simply male violence against women and children. And by that, they would mean domestic abuse, domestic violence, child sexual abuse, rape, sexual harassment, sexual assault. They would include all those things in that overall heading of male violence against women and children and also marginalised men that that violence takes place against as well. And there are so we know that this is, of course, a huge issue. You're looking at about one in four women being affected by domestic abuse at some point in their life. We're in the middle of a global pandemic and there has been headlines about the increase in domestic homicides during the first few weeks of the lockdown, for example. So in, in the usual circumstances, it's estimated that about two women every week in this country are murdered by a violent male partner or ex-partner. That increased then during the first few weeks of, of the lockdown. From British, from the what used to be called the British Crime Survey, of course now the England and Wales Crime Surveys, we, it's estimated there's about 80,000 rapes every year, about 400,000 sexual assaults. So these are quite epidemic statistics, they're quite epidemic figures. And the point, radical feminism, when I say that radical feminism wrote the book on male violence, they really did, because at that time, during the second wave, it was revolutionary and radical feminists who were the first to start writing about rape, sexual violence, child abuse. They wrote some of the key texts. They were there setting up movements against these crimes. And they were there theorizing it from the ground up. And that theory came from what was called CR groups or consciousness raising groups, where women collectivized and theorized their own experiences. And so that's why radical feminism said, well, it's all very well looking at things like equality in the workplace, equality in roles and careers. But in order to have those things, you need to have a right to life. You have a right to safety. You must have a right to, to freedom, to bodily integrity. And when so many women don't experience that, and when so many women grow up in fear of male violence, even if they haven't experienced it, this has an effect on how women participate in public life. You can see that even if you look at things like Plan International and their Day of the Girl campaign, or if you look at the Girl Guides and their Girls' Attitude surveys, you find quite high percentages of girls and young women who say that they feel frightened to go out after dark, that they've been sexually harassed from the ages of about 12, 13, their first experiences, that they felt frightened, that they've had to phone family members to come and collect them. That is a form of curfew almost. It's a, an imposition on how women partake in and use public space and public life. You might not join a group because you know you're going to have to walk back late at night. You might not go to a certain club or, or, or pub or meeting because you don't like the route home because there's not much street lights or you have to get an overland train that has a weird underpass on the way to it or a covered bridge. Women are thinking about those things a lot of the time. And so that's why radical feminists pointed out that male violence was also a form of social control, that you had to take it out from the individual and you had to look at it as a form of social control. The threat and all reality of it affects how women participate in public life. Thank you. And I, I just wondered how much that connects with the, the third point about pornography, actually. Um, do you think those aspects of sexual violence, are, uh, uh, you know, they start through, through the watching of pornography? Well, 
I mean, this is, again, if you look at so media studies, sociology would always reject a sort of hypodermic syringe model like monkey see, monkey do kind of thing when you're looking at any images in the media. But of course, billions and billions are invested in, in advertising, um, in subtle messages that you can send to people via the media. So obviously it does, does work to some degree. It does have an effect, but it also creates a cultural backdrop. And that's where feminists like um, Professor Liz Kelly, for example, who's head of the Child and Woman Abuse Studies Unit at London Metropolitan University, this phrase, this term, she calls a conducive context. So she says, well, look at society and say, hmm, is this a conducive context for sexualized male violence against women and children? Does the cultural imagery in this society make it more or less likely that that kind of violence will take place? And this is where we get to what's called the continuum of male violence against women and children. So you've got your brutal statistics at one end, but then at the other end, you have things like imagery in computer games, you have images in mainstream freely available pornography, you have things like brat dolls, you have things like adverts for the sun showing, you know, topless women, you have page three still, you have national newspapers doing countdowns of female celebrities until they're old enough to get their kit off in their newspaper. So all of that at the other end is propping up, radical feminists would argue, the brutal statistics at the other end. Because the point is, if you portray women and children as objects, if you portray women in particular as sex objects that are there to be used and abused, that are there to be marked out of 10, scrutinized by men, that are just presented as nothing more than sex objects, then you cannot be surprised when women are treated as objects in their workplace, in their homes, in the streets, because you already have begun that process of objectification quite early on. And I think even just looking at that backdrop, it's often just not a positive representation of women and young women's sexuality. It often overplays myths about women's masochism, women's sexuality. It shows women as prey and men as predators. Those images, they set up this different species approach to men and women. And it's, it's a sexual dynamic of predator and prey. And of course, all feminism has forever tried to put back women's agency and say, women too have their own desires and their own sexuality. It doesn't just have to be mediated via men and what people think men want, but we don't even know what that would look like. You look at freely available pornography um, on things like Pornhub, there's evidence that young people, not just boys, boys and girls are accessing this from sort of early teens upwards or have seen it. There's been content analysis of that kind of pornography done. A lot of it is full of rape narratives. It's just full of narratives about women needing to be dominated and controlled, taken down a peg or two, taught a lesson, and then women are portrayed as liking that and wanting that. Yeah. So is that a healthy backdrop in which to grow up, to explore your own sexuality, to form good relationships with other people, be they men or women. I, d I don't think it is. Because I don't trust the state, I think it's a blunt instrument and the law is a blunt instrument. I'm not saying let's just go in and ban everything, but do I think a lot of that imagery orders on inciting violence against women and eroticizing violence against women and turning scenes of pseudo rape and sexual abuse into a turn on it does yeah okay, that's really interesting you say that because i think one of the, the pornographic companies it may have been the one that you mentioned did a study to find that a lot of females are accessing that type of pornography and then also something like the popularity of a book like 50 shades of gray that that's quite confusing isn't it to understand why that would be popular um yeah written by a female author of course well, it is, everything is riddled with contradictions, but then just as those gender messages are sent to men, they're sent to women as well. So yeah. you can't grow up in a culture that tells you it's the height of femininity and desirability to submit yourself to a man's power, and that that is what eroticism is, that is what sexuality is. In a culture where women are taught to spend a lot of time and effort and money on making themselves desirable and attractive to men and that 
finding that and succeeding in gaining that sexual attractiveness to men is a very important defining feature of you as a person and your worth as a person. You can't teach what that on the one hand and then not expect it to sink in and to change how people behave. Of course it does. I mean, when I say we're all implicated in this, nobody lives in a bubble. We all grow up in this. I suppose the point is, assume that this isn't nature. So what is going on here? Who's benefiting from the way these things have been constructed? What are the underlying messages that are getting sent? What's the ideology at work here? Because there is always some ideology at work. We're all implicated in it, yes, but women are told this is what femininity is, this is what heterosexuality is, and if you want to look good, if you want men to fancy you, if you want to be desirable and a proper woman, then this is what it's all about, is getting excited about men's power rather than having power yourself. All the evidence suggests that that is purely nurture, right? Socialization. There's nothing biological to suggest that men and women be attracted to those things. Is that right? Well, I'm very anti-essentialist, so that's what I think. But as you know, you can go and look at the research and you'll find 50% will say, oh, it's quite clear that these particular neural pathways were formed and in the womb this much testosterone or whatever causes this. But then science also points out the plasticity of the brain and how things are learned and how environment shapes you and that's a very easy thought experiment because you can imagine well what if i'd been born in a very strict religious community of one sort or another or i'd been born in a different part of the world where culture is very different where ideas of sexuality are very different then you too would have a different style of sexuality you look at things like what michael messner's looked at you look at situational sexualities so Boys and men who find themselves in male-only communities will experiment and explore with sex acts between each other. That doesn't mean that they suddenly develop this identity of being a homosexual or being gay. They're just exploring sex and sexuality. So how we as a society frame those acts, of course, then also creates them in the first place. But I would say I would be very uncomfortable with the notion of saying that men's sexuality is naturally violent, domineering, controlling, and that's all that they get off on. And women's sexuality is very much passive, wanting to be led, masochistic, wanting to be controlled. I think even if you look at this, if you looked at this culture, you would want to be saying, okay, well, if it really was nature, then you would surely expect quite a lot of women as well to quite like dominating and controlling others. And you would what you would probably find, you know, large numbers of men as well who were quite masochistic or like to be controlled. We don't know because sexuality is this pornified kind of plastic, fantastic, you know, very idealized fake image that we see in mainstream pornography, which is people, of course, we shouldn't forget. It's people acting. It's scripted acting. We don't even know what human sexuality would look like because our culture is so saturated with this very gendered imagery. Thank you, Finn. That's really, really interesting. Should we look, should we look at the last area? Um, mm -hmm. Leadership, you said, was number four. So women's self-organisation as a political right, I think, was very fundamental to radical feminism. So a lot of those women in the early days, in the 60s and 70s, they'd been involved in social justice movements, as I said, black power movements, uh, movements against the Vietnam War, a revolutionary period anyway. They were involved in what was called the New Left. And within that, they found men within those movements to be sexist, to not be great at putting women forward, to not be great at platforming women. They found that women always tended to be in back office roles. They were expected to be support staff. They were expected to just be cheerleaders for male heroes. And the women realized that actually, sometimes it is important to step away from that dominant culture and set up your own space where you can work out what your needs are, what your goals are, and you can do it yourself. And so I think women's self-organization and leadership is very important. I mean, in the feminist movement, who should lead that movement? It should be those who are most affected by the forces that we're struggling against. So of course women should lead that movement. In women-only space, you will find that women feel often freer to speak. They are more likely to put themselves forward for things. Having been involved in women-only space myself, there's practical examples. So when we had to design the website, when we had to get leaflets printed, when we had to do yeah, the print layout and things like this, was there somebody in those groups nearly every time who said, 
my boyfriend's a web designer, my brother's a graphic designer, my dad has a printing company. Of course, of course they were. Would it have been a hell of a lot easier to do that? Yes. <laughs> but the principles of women's self-organization were, no, either we will learn it or we will find a woman that we know who is doing those things. If you look at one of the biggest examples, maybe, of women's um, self-organization and women-only living would be something like Green and Common. So the largest women-only peace protest the world has ever seen in the 1980s at the Green and Common American air base near Newbury in Berkshire where nuclear missiles were stationed. Now those women said, no, we will not talk to your male lawyers. We will not talk to your male journalists. We will not have male cameramen here. Funnily enough, those businesses then went away and said, oh, okay, actually we do have one camera woman who works for us sometimes, or oh, actually we do have a woman journalist who's just coming up. It's not an exaggeration to say that women got jobs and kept them in certain industries around the time of the height of Greenham because women gave other women work. And that is kind of walking the walk as well as talking the talk. It was about putting women's leadership first, centering women and saying, hang on, don't lie to me. I know you can find a woman who can do this as good as a man, but go away and find one and then come back. So just to dispel one of the myths, it, it wasn't anything to do with man hating, of course. It was more to see what women could do with, without the men there. Is that right? Absolutely. To foster women's skills and to empowerment has become such a cliche term. You know, nowadays empowerment is from buying a makeup or buying a new fashion magazine or a diet drink or something. But that was empowerment in its political sense. It was giving women power for a change. And of course, it's interesting that people look at that and they say, hmm, women giving other women work, promoting other women, skilling up other women, oh, that seems really distasteful, that seems really exclusionary, that seems really unfair. That is how the world of men in industry and business and politics works and has always worked. If people don't like positive discrimination, if they don't like unfair, you know, balancing of things, then they need to look at the way the world currently is because that is unfair. So what you had was women trying to redress that balance by saying we are excluded. In the grand scheme, it's not been that long since women could even get jobs in certain industries, were allowed to even get a degree or even go to school. So it was women saying, hang on, we are going to promote ourselves for a change. We're going to give women a chance to get into these jobs that we have been barred from in terms of the law in history and then in terms of subtle forms of manipulation and discrimination which promoted women at the expense of men. It wasn't just about turning it round and saying okay well we're just going to be just as nasty because the balance is already unfair in men's favour. So what that is about is trying to redress the balance. That's where things like equal opportunities, positive affirmative action, it's about trying to address an underlying unfair balance. It wouldn't be needed if the unfair balance wasn't already yeah. there. Yeah, if it wasn't there in the first place. And um, what? Because one of the other myths, of course, is that, that radical feminism is just is just misandry. Um, where, where do you stand on that? What would your answer be to that statement? Well, if you look at one of the most famous poster girls for American radical feminism was a writer called Andrea Dworkin who wrote extensively against the pornography industry. She had been involved in a lot of social movements. She was an anti-racism campaigner. Um, she campaigned for prison abolition. She campaigned for mental health services uh, for women. She was involved in a lot of social justice activism but she was also a radical feminist and wrote against pornography and prostitution. And she always said and I quote, we are not feminists because we hate men. We are feminists because we believe in men's humanity against all evidence to the contrary. The whole point of radical feminism was that men are human beings as well. And we live in a culture that has tried to strip men of their humanity. And for that, men pay a price and women and children in particular often pay a bloody and violent price. And all of us have an investment in changing that situation. Radical feminism is the exact opposite of man-hating because radical feminism has always demonstrated a profound belief in and faith in and love for men as 
the other half of the human species of which we were all we are all a part because radical feminism says the way things are are not normal lots of behaviors might be common but it doesn't mean that they're normal and that this imposition of these gender norms is brutalizing and the brutalizing impact of patriarchy tries to strip boys and men of their humanity and for that violating process and the result of it is that men pay a very steep price and women and children in particular often pay a violent and bloody and final price and all of us have an investment in changing that if radical feminism really thought that men are just naturally biologically warmongers woman haters that they're just biologically programmed to want to violently compete put other men down put women down abuse and control women and children and that's just the way they biologically are then what would be the point of a social movement for revolutionary change it would be pointless if you really believe that you would have to go off and become a separatist start up women's communities keep yourself safe if you really thought that but of course radical feminists thought the very opposite of that it was a hopeful and positive movement for change therefore it demonstrates a faith that men are just as good and caring as the next person thank you ben that's lovely to hear that as well and i've certainly learned a huge amount today uh, from your input and i hope that's dispelled quite a few of the myths that unfortunately are in some of the textbooks uh, and are out there as well Thank you, Finn. And um, where can people find out more details about your book? I know you're on Twitter as well. Yes, I'm all over Twitter usually. Um, and my book is called Radical Feminism, uh, Feminist Activism in Movement. It's published by Palgrave. Um, you can find it on the Palgrave website. It's available on, you know, all sort of bookseller websites as well. Um, I have a website as well, which is just Um and I'm in the moment, I'm currently writing a new book for a part of Bloomsbury Academic, which is going to be on masculinities, queer masculinities and the gender wars. So look out for that landing sometime soon. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your uh, time today. That's really great. Thank you. That's all right. Nice to meet you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you would like to contact the show or be interviewed, then please email the Sociology Show podcast at gmail.com.